So, as some of you might know, I uh, like to mess around with banjos. It's, it's sort of my hobby, building banjos, playing banjos. I think I'm a better builder than a player by a long shot, but anyhow, it's uh, what keeps me amused on the weekends and the evenings. And uh, so to that end, I got a little job from a friend, a fellow banjo builder, my friend Alex, who has a little business called Fundy Banjos. He's over on the other coast in Nova Scotia. So he's got a little banjo repair job and I offered to help him out by making some hardware. It's sort of, it's a very old turn of the century banjo with some weird hardware that is just absolutely not available anymore. And so this video is uh, goes into a little bit of the efforts that I've been making towards helping him with that. And it has nothing to do with making the actual hardware exactly, but making some tools that I need to make that hardware. So um, let's check that out. So the goal is to make some of this uh, hardware, this, this like a little banjo, um, banjo pot tensioner, turnbuckle. So it's right hand threaded on one side, left hand on the other. So getting tops and dies for the right hand side, no problem. Well, it's a problem if I want the actual die. I'm not trying to, if I want the actual, the same thread, this is like a British 826 or something weird like that, which we can just absolutely, I cannot find without going to uh, specialty sources, like beyond like McMaster car. So I went with 832 since I don't really need to have them match anything or be interchangeable. And um, while I can certainly get 832 right hand taps and dies, no problem. Left hand, a little bit difficult. In fact, or, or rather very uh, considerably expensive. So it's about 50 bucks for one, one die. The taps are cheap. Taps are still like 10 bucks a piece. So I decided to try making a die. And so my first attempts were pretty miserable failures, just trying to figure out what the best order of operations is. And then of course, accuracy. We were having some trouble with the DRO on the on the mill. Kept uh, screwing up on us. So I made got one attempt out that was whoop, fair to Midland. Or did I lose that? Oh, there we go. Fair to Midland, but I figured the, the threads in there were like way too, like the, the cutting surfaces are too small. So I figured it, it might work for a couple, you know, an inch or two, but I had a feeling it would break down on me pretty fast. So I decided to try again and give myself more cutting surface, more threaded surface. So then I knocked out these two. And um, so, Two, just because if I'm making one, I could, you know, I just made a deeper stack and then sliced off two pieces. So they seem to be working great. I, my first attempt at using them, they were producing some pretty shit th threads, but then I realized I hadn't really cleaned up very well. So I need to get in, I had to get in there. Figure out how to get rid of the, uh, the burrs, which is a bit tricky because once it's cut into this configuration, you can't just run a tap through it so easily. So I ended up just chucking it up in my little Emco lathe here, or Unimat lathe, sorry, and uh, and putting a, a tap into the drill chuck, but leaving it loose so it's like a tap follower, and then carefully trying to get the threads engaged on the uh, on the lathe's chuck, just running it manually. I think my first attempt, I think my first attempt was this guy, maybe, and. Um, one of the issues I was having was I was doing it with twist bits, doing starting with pilot holes and drilling through until I was breaking through the center. Then I think I broke out. I think what happened here is basically I realized that I wasn't, the, my center was off for some reason. We had some screw up with trying to, I think we were trying to measure off the inside of this threaded hole and that was that was it a pro that was problematic so I, uh so i guess i turned this down turned one of these down to size on the lathe did a pilot hole on the lathe i guess i guess i tapped it on the lathe too i can't remember now if i tapped them on the lathe both times and then um when i did my second round i used my the, the feeler or the wobbler to find the edges of this and find my center. I was just real careful to make sure everything was nice and dialed in. 
So I reset up, and then I think I managed to pull this one off, and I think I did this one with quarter inch milling bit. Yeah, I think that's what I did there. And that worked okay, I suppose. Oh, that's a thread. threads. But as I said, I thought, I felt the um, threads were too small. And then I went down to a 3 16 um, end mill. And that seemed to work okay. Just was more careful with my setup. Then I used the dividing head for doing the uh, these dimples here in this little slot. And just used a countersink to do the taper. So there's my finished products, and I think they turned out reasonably good, actually. So my test drive produced some usable threads. So I guess I guess success. The one question I have is whether I should harden them, because I'm just doing brass, right? I basically I'm only threading the equivalent of one of these rods all the way through, although it's all like it's little hooks, so it's just short segments. But since there's only 10, 12 of them, maybe I'm gonna make. Um, my worry is if I try and harden them that when I bring these guys up to temperature it's gonna cook the um, the threads like the sharp cutting edges so that's what I'm worried about so uh, I don't know should I do it should I not do it I've never I've never tried heat treating something where you've already got a finished cutting edge on it. And usually when I heat treat stuff, like doing knives and things like that, it's always get them close, heat treat them, and then sharpen them. So here's my bending jig, which is pretty darn janky. And I, uh, it's because I went through several iterations to try and figure it out. At least it works. I mean, it's only got to do, it's got to do like 20, 20 of those hooks maybe. So that'll be fine. It's a pretty tight bend, so annealing the brass ahead of time is probably a good idea. And I think I'll probably tack on something to control like the length of this thing, so I uh, so I get a consistent distance of hook from the, the threaded portion. I don't know what that's going to be just yet. And clearly I, I still have a little bit of cleanup to do on this jig. <laughs> so I'll we'll just have to chop these off to match the other hooks, but otherwise that's pretty darn good. Bit of a burr there, I'm going to have to figure out how to soften this up a little bit, I guess. But other than that, that's looking fine. Oh, okay, it's on the back side. Good to know. All right. Another success. This looks a bit weird because I put a, um, I actually drilled a hole here and dropped a, a 332nd drill bit in here to act as a hardened bending surface because I knew this sort of cheesy, uh, cheesy steel here wasn't going to stand up to bending very, for very long. And uh, this is such a tight bend that that's what made this whole jig tricky is trying to figure out how do I bend around this really small radius especially when the radius is you know a third smaller than the actual rod that I'm trying to bend it's even almost oversized that bend because it needs to be a bit tighter still but I can give that a whack with a hammer to tighten it up more 
So this jig was looking a whole lot more hopeful when I started it. And this uh, machining wasn't looking so sloppy. So my first attempt, I had my pin way out at the edge. But then I realized I needed to be rotating right around the center of the bolt here. So I, um, I put it at the edge because I thought I needed more meat to resist the bend. But uh, obviously I figured, figured out the hard way that that wasn't going to work. So then uh, I had to switch to all the rest of my machining here over on my, my Unimat set up in the milling machine capacity. But there's a lot of height between the bottom of this thing and that vise up to the bit. And so it was wagging around like crazy. Plus my the only um, end mill that I had was pretty dull, so I made an attempt at freehand sharpening a four flute quarter inch end mill, but but that uh, that doesn't go well. But anyway, we got it done. So there's a little drill bit that's been placed right at the leading edge of that to harden up the bending surface, and then I just did a little spot well to try and tie it into the little. Uh, web that's in behind it so I, I should the only welder we have over at the other shop with the bigger machines is sort of this weird little um mig welder which i cannot get a feel for so i use my stick welder here at home anyhow that's not a beautiful looking thing by a long shot but it'll it's enough to uh knock out this these few hooks that i need to do so that's a success as far as I'm concerned. So I really like screwing around with uh, machining. I, I'm not good at it by a long shot. It's really just something I, I like to play with. And uh, so that sort of goes hand in hand with some of the banjo building that I do. And now I've created a second channel called Stork Banjos. That's the, that's the, the brand name that I build my banjos under. It's not really a business exactly, but um, I'll, I'll sell a banjo now and then or do a commission now and then. Anyhow, so I've started a separate YouTube channel called Stork Banjos. So if you want to join me over there for more stuff like this, please do. Uh, at the moment, there's nothing on the channel. I haven't started populating it with videos just yet, but go ahead and subscribe and get notified when videos about that stuff do come out. Okay, that's it for this week, folks. Catch you later.